Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I just got a new retro laptop to add to the collection and I only recently realized how relatively big of a laptop collection I actually have at this point, send help. Uh, but I just wanted to take a little bit and kind of check this one out and show it off to you. This is gonna be a bit more of a casual video, not so scripted and, and formulaic like I normally produce. This is a Toshiba Satellite 310 CDS, and it dates back to about 1998. This was during an era when laptops were still really expensive, at least compared to desktops, but the market for laptops was starting to really expand. So we began to see laptops show up in different market segments, like geared towards different people and use cases, and this machine was really meant more for kind of basic use, business operations, productivity kind of stuff, and not so much as a high performance desktop replacement. There isn't much going on across the front, just some indicator lights. On the right side, you've got the floppy drive and CD-ROM, and those are both built in. And then behind those, behind this flip down door are a pair of PCM CIA card slots. And this machine happened to come to me with, this is a very classic card, the Zircom 56K modem card. It requires a little dongle to actually plug the phone line in. And I probably have one of those floating around somewhere. And then above that, you've got a wheel for the display contrast, and we'll get to that in a bit. Around back is a very typical selection of ports from this machine's era. VGA, parallel, serial, and then the vent for the fan. And then across from that, you've got regular DC power input, PS2 for keyboard or mouse. And then behind the little slide down door is a single USB 1.0 port. Right next to that is an infrared port, and that could be used for synchronizing things like a PDA, a Palm Pilot, stuff like that, for sending contacts back and forth. And then finally, on the left side, you've got the audio jacks and volume wheel, and then the power button, and the power button is interesting. It's behind this little slide door to protect it, I guess, like if it's in the laptop bag so it doesn't accidentally get pressed and turned on when you don't want it to. Something really useful about this machine from a retro slash collecting perspective is the way they did the battery. And I actually wish more classic retro laptops had done this. Of course, it goes into the bottom of the computer like most of them do. You unlatch it and pull it out. But what I really like is the fact that the battery pack itself can separate from the cover for the battery compartment. What this means is that eventually this battery pack is going to either start leaking or because this one's lithium ion, it's gonna inflate, you know, balloon up. We've seen that happen before. I'm one of the kind of people where for retro laptops, I don't care if it even has a battery. I'm not gonna be some kind of hipster who takes a 20 year old computer to Starbucks and tries to type out a novel on it or anything like that. I'm gonna plug it in, it's gonna stay home. I don't need battery support for it. So eventually, to be able to take the battery out and dispose of it properly, yet still have the machine cosmetically look complete because you can stick the cover back on there, that's a big win for me. Something else that's really nice is the accessibility for this machine for upgrades and repairs. The bottom cover for the hard drive is just a single screw. And then from there, the hard drive just snaps out of its connector and pulls out. And then you can just swap the drive in the cage. It's not quite tool free, but a single Phillips screw will get you there. And that's really useful, especially as those old IDE hard drives start to fail over time, or maybe you wanna to upgrade to a larger one to put more software on this thing. You can easily swap it out with a compact flash or SD card adapter, or if you've got deep pockets, one of the relatively expensive proper IDE solid state drives. So the machine was sent my way by a viewer and fellow Minnesotan named Tim. Yeah, you betcha, buddy. And it included, to my surprise, a printout of the machine's service manual. Apparently this is still available on like archive.org. This actually ended up proving 
very helpful because unfortunately, when I first got the machine, it wasn't quite working right. It apparently originally came from Goodwill and Tim had, you know, poked around with it to, you know, try to get it running again. And he noted a couple of problems. One is that the time on the machine, like when you would boot it up, you would get an error basically saying that the clock battery was bad. And I'm not really surprised by that given the machine's age. The other problem he said is that the machine would randomly just shut off on him. And when I first started goofing with this machine, it did the same thing for me too. It wasn't predictable. It would just run for three to five minutes and then just poof, turn off, no warning. It's not like it was going to sleep or anything. It just hard power off. Sometimes it would go longer than that, but there was no consistency to it. I couldn't reproduce it on demand, unfortunately, because I can't show you a video of it. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna take this thing apart and see what's going on inside. Thankfully, it's actually fairly straightforward to work on. So not only is that hard drive and battery easy to access, but taking this thing apart, it's not too terribly involved. You do need to take the hard drive and the battery out and then a few screws get removed from the bottom. Around back, two screws over by the display hinges need to come out. And then there's some more on the top. You remove the plastic strip across the top of the keyboard. It just snaps in there. And then you can flip the keyboard over and release the flat flex connector. Underneath that, there's just a few more screws and then some more connectors for things like the display video and a couple of two wire connections for buttons and lights and that sort of stuff. And then the entire top half of the machine, including the screen, just kind of unsnaps from the bottom and you've got full access to the motherboard. When I got this thing taken apart, I discovered the cause of the battery problem. And that was, well, the battery had actually blown up inside or at least started leaking pretty bad. And Tim had said he'd removed it in troubleshooting purposes, but what I noticed is it apparently leaked and corroded so bad it took the connector for the battery off the motherboard. That was just straight up missing. Around that connector, I did notice some signs of leakage and corrosion, so I got that cleaned up with an alcohol wipe. Looking elsewhere on the board, I saw a line of components that had some sort of residue around them. It's possible maybe this machine had a light liquid spill at some point in the past. Not quite sure. There was no corrosion around those parts, so the damage there really was kind of minimal. And it cleaned up super easy with alcohol, like you wouldn't know that it had happened. And strangely enough, after putting the machine back together, cleaning up those parts, I decided not to bother replacing the clock battery simply because, well, again, I mean, I'm just gonna use this for short periods of time. I don't care if the date and time are accurate on it. Well, it's been fine ever since. I let it run for an entire day, stayed powered on the whole time. So I can only guess that maybe that power off problem was due to some weird intermittent short just caused by some partially conductive electrolyte leakage or something like that that had gotten on a section of the motherboard. No problem. Like I said, you know, computers from back in their era, they started to see some kind of market segmentation, right? And, well, this is definitely from the lower end, <laughs> let's just say. You can tell right away here, the quality of the screen is pretty bad. Now, part of this could be due to just its age and perhaps some failing components. I didn't see any leaking capacitors, but perhaps some of the caps on like the display inverter board are starting to get a little weak, that sort of thing. But the other thing is the display on this thing was low end to begin with. The model of this computer is the 310 CDS, and it turns out the DS in the name stands for dual scan, which is a type of LCD technology. It's an advanced form of a passive matrix display, and long story short, there was still a big kind of difference between various types of LCD screens in the late 90s, up and through that period. 
And there were some big price differences between them too. Oh, Windows is yelling at me here. I should also note that um, I spent way too much time trying to figure out what the password is on this computer before remembering, oh, this is Windows 98, you can just hit escape. <laughs> I'm out of practice with this apparently. The display on this one is low end for cost reasons. Basically, what's going on is passive matrix displays just don't refresh very quickly at all. Higher end active matrix displays are way better, of course, and they existed during this time period, but they were just so much more expensive. So manufacturers frequently offered multiple display options within the same family of computer model in order to offer different price points. So this machine was going to be one of the more, let's say, entry level models in the lineup. It otherwise is actually a decent computer. It's a 200 megahertz Pentium MMX. They came stock with 32 megabytes of RAM and a two gigabyte IDE hard drive. You can upgrade the RAM in this thing pretty easily as well. You just flip the keyboard over and there's an open RAM slot right there underneath it. So upgrading the RAM is literally tool free since you can just pry that plastic strip up by hand. And performance wise, it's actually not bad. Like any machine from its era, a lot of the times it's held back by the performance of its hard drive. See, and you can see what I mean. This thing is still trying to boot up and it's been what, a couple of minutes? It's Obviously, I need to wipe the hard drive on this thing and start fresh. I'll probably put Windows 98 back on it. Um, but there's just a lot of stuff on this computer that it needs to get through when starting up, I guess. You can also tell here that the display has gone kind of yellow, and that's just a chronic problem with most LCD screens that are upwards of 20 years old. That's a function of the backlight. Not really a whole lot that you can do about it unless you get lucky and find like a new old stock display that has zero hours on it. Obviously not worth it in this case. The big problem with this display is because it's passive matrix, the viewing angles kind of suck, the color kind of sucks, the contrast kind of sucks. I mean, it's, it's a low end display and you kind of accept that going into it. The real problem though is the refresh rate on it. It's so bad that you end up with this problem when you're moving the mouse cursor around. It's called submarining. The refresh rate of the pixels themselves is so low that if you move the mouse cursor quickly, it literally disappears from screen. And so if you've ever gone into like the mouse control panel and seen that option for mouse trails, that's actually why that exists. By turning mouse trails on, it leaves that trail of the cursor. So when you're moving it around on screen, you can actually see it. Uh, the touch point on this machine is actually pretty decent. I would say it's about on par with the ThinkPad. This sort of input arrangement has never been my favorite. I'm just more of a touchpad kind of guy, but it's not bad. The buttons are a little rubbery. The keyboard, again, not ThinkPad kind of quality, but I've definitely typed on worse. So, you know, back when this thing was new, for the money, it was probably a decent value. So, I mean, given the relatively low price of this machine back when it was new, and I'd like to say it was right around 2000 bucks or so in 1998 for this model, the low end, the CDS, you could spend another few hundred to upgrade to the 310 CDT. And the difference there was just the screen. It put you into an active matrix screen. That would have been a much better way to go if you needed this as a primary computer and the display kind of mattered to you. 2000 bucks is a lot of money for a laptop these days, but it was actually very reasonable back then. I mean, Anywhere between 2000 and 3000 bucks was pretty typical for kind of a mid-range, decently performing machine. 1500 which is still expensive for a computer now, that got you a really low-end laptop in the mid to late 90s. So I feel like the people who bought these probably felt like they got a good value. And that kind of explains also why they sold so many of these. I think a lot of other businesses and companies bought these machines for their employees really as kind of 
one of the first models of laptop that was really economically feasible to buy for regular employees to use. You didn't have to be some sort of special power user to justify having a laptop back then. If you needed portable computing, the prices had come down generally to the point where a company could justify buying you one. Granted, you'd get something like a passive matrix screen. It wasn't going to be an amazing experience, but it was still going to be affordable and justifiable for them to do so. Now that said, this really was a computer meant for business. Out of curiosity, I tried to put some games on here. And the one that I really like to use, I guess admittedly more for nostalgia than anything else, is Quake 3 Arena. I couldn't even get the game to run. And as it turns out, the graphics in this computer, which is based on Chips and Technologies chipset, doesn't support 3D acceleration. The game wouldn't launch because of the lack of OpenGL. And so if you wanted to use one of these for gaming, you're kind of stuck with like DOS based games, that sort of thing. The graphics chipset just not really meant for anything other than basic productivity use. Now, I'm sure it will handle DOS games just fine. The big question then is going to be sound, because I know a lot of people who are really into DOS gaming are kind of persnickety about the way those games end up sounding. This thing has built-in sound, of course, and, well, here's a sample of its MIDI capabilities. I'm not really a connoisseur of such things, so I'll let you decide for yourself whether you think it sounds good or not. So do I recommend this particular model if you are looking to get into retro laptops and playing DOS games and that sort of thing? Kind of. I can't say that this specific one, the 310 CDS, is necessarily the best idea. And it all comes down to the quality of that screen. Dual scan passive matrix displays were always a compromise. They were really just meant to be the low cost option. And I feel like we're all so used to looking at high quality screens these days, it's gonna be a tough pill to swallow to go back to something as relatively low end as this one. The 310 CDT with that TN panel is gonna be the one to look out for. And I do generally recommend the Toshiba satellite series of laptops for people who do want to get into retro collecting alongside ThinkPads, of course. Not just because these machines were generally well built during their time period, and of course they sold a number of them, so they're fairly prolific on the used market, but also because support for them now is amazing. Here's the thing, Toshiba got out of the US computer market not too long ago, and the assets for all of that were picked up by another company called Dynabook. Now, Toshiba for a long time, and in a previous video where I looked at another sub-notebook from Toshiba, I noted that Toshiba themselves still had drivers for all of their retro products listed on their website. They had no need to do so, but they were all still there. The thing that blew my mind was when I got this machine and started looking into what I would need when I wanted to go and wipe the hard drive, Dynabook even picked up all those software downloads. So at least at the time I'm filming this, you can still go and get all of the drivers you would need for like Windows 95, 98, whatever, for computers that are like 25 years old, still from their website directly. You don't need to go scavenging around the internet to try and find it. So if you want a less hassle type of experience, you just want to you know, play games or goof around with software and not necessarily go through the whole journey of trying to restore a retro computer, 
one of these Toshiba machines in general could be a great idea. Again, thank you, Tim, for sending this one my way. It's definitely a blast from my own past. I fondly remember this machine and I'm glad to have it in my collection again. If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.